Hello everyone and welcome to the very first event of the London Constructing Excellent Clubs Programme 2022, which in traditional style is our AGM. My name is Elvin, Elvin Box, and I have the very real privilege of being the current chair of London Constructing Excellence. Now, I hope you're all well, and I trust you are feeling upbeat and positive as the UK gears up to move away from the pandemic and into the endemic phase of COVID-19. Our event this evening will commence with the formal business of the London Constructing Excellence Club's AGM. Then we shall swiftly flow into the evening's talk, which is going to be an open, honest and extremely candid account of the Grenfell Tower disaster as told by Jill Koenig. Now, please note, good people, hashtags tonight are hashtag LCEC, AGM, hashtag LCEC, C-A-S-C, and hashtag Grenfell. Thank you, everybody. Right. So, two key points to raise before we start the proceedings. One, as you're aware, uh, for presentation purposes, you have all been muted. Please would you be kind enough to turn uh, off your cameras. As you will note, we are using Slido to enable interaction during the presentation uh, with our guest speaker. During uh, our Q&A, we'll be reverting back uh, to the um, chat on Teams. Thank you. Now, number two, please be aware that this evening's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel within the next two days. So without further ado, uh, let's go with the former business of the AGM. So let me see if I can switch screens so we can get something for you to watch. That should be good, shouldn't it? OK, everybody. Two seconds, he said knowingly. Any luck in a fair wind? We should be there. I'm assuming everybody can see what's on the screen, he said. Yes, Paul, could you second that for me? Yes. Go. <laughs> Excellent. Let's get through this as quick as I can. This is our annual general meeting, everybody. Uh, AGM Ordinary Business. So could uh, someone please propose uh, and second a chairperson for the AGM's formal opening? Uh, Paul Greenwood, I propose Elvin Box. I second that. Adrian Dawson. Thank well done, Adrian. Thank you so much. So thanks for the online production support from Said. Thanks to current club officers and committee members seeking re-election and the following who are departing. Robert Reed done a sterling job as our treasurer. Sophia Boyd has done a brilliant job helping us with our events. And Ian Farmer, who's looking after management development. Thank you, three good people, very much for your dedication. Ordinary business continued here. This is the uh, London Contract Clubs 2021 annual report and accounts. This is available from the, uh, our website and via social media links. Uh, you can all see clearly what the uh, statement is rather than boil. Just to ask, can I have a proposal, please, for this? I'm happy to propose, Paul Greenwood. And seconded, please. I second that. Thank you so much indeed. Adrian. So ordinary business continued number two. Uh, this is the London Contract Excellent Club's uh, 2020 Treasures Report. Income from subscriptions is £970 purely and simply because we've not been actively seeking membership as we're into the second year basically of lockdown. Um, sales of tickets only uh, had a limited opportunity for a live event, which was our uh, December annual wine tasting, hence just £450. Other income, it sounds like a 1922 committee, isn't it? It's three pounds and nine pence. That was bank interest. Uh, operating expenses, just 784 pounds and 14 P. Surplus of 638 pounds, 75 pence. Subscriptions for 2022 membership rates remain as ever. Uh, since 2018, when I started doing this chair uh, business, uh, we, the, 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 um, the subscription Oh, the membership rates, sorry, have remained the same and they shall remain the same yet again. Thank you so much, uh, Independent Inspector Vianic Pelling. Could I have a proposal and a seconder, please, for the 
uh, Treasurer's report. Thank you. Happy to propose, Paul Greenwood. Thank you, sir. I second that, Adrian Dawson. Thank you, my friends. Just very quickly flicking on through now. Invitation for other nominations have not occurred, so none to read out. Uh, nominations for election of uh, London Contracting Next Club officers and notification of other committee members is as follows. These good people, all seeking re-election, except for our wonderful new treasurer, Sam, Sam Braniff, uh, who is seeking election. Please note, we are seeking a membership development manager. That position is open. And we're also open uh, for people to volunteer to be deputy systems manager and website administration. Hopefully that all makes good sense. Uh, please could I have a proposer for the notification of elected officers, please. I propose Paul Greenwood. Thank you, sir. And seconded by? Uh, Adrian Dawson. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Paul. These two wonderful chaps are notifying these are non-elected officers. This is James Green and Tim King. Special and other business. There is no special business. Any other business whatsoever, please do show your hands. But I think I'm right in saying there's uh, no requirement for that. Is it OK uh, that I declare this part of the meeting closed? And thank you so much. But before I leave that, our next networking breakfast will be as soon as circumstances allow at a venue in central London. Uh, there you go. Our, our breakfast will be up and running as soon as possible, good people. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to go through that as quickly as I did. Very, very grateful indeed to you all. Now, I would like to tell you about tonight's guest speaker, Jill Koenig. Having personally been impacted by the Grenfell Tower fire, combined with her thinking of major accidents prevention, Jill Koenig has a unique perspective that will most definitely uh, provide thoughtful discussion this evening. You see, Jill lived on the 21st floor of Grenfell Tower from 2011 to 2014. Seven of her former neighbours died in the fire which started in the 24th hour Grenfell Tower on the 14th of June, 2017, 54 minutes past midnight. More than 250 London Fire Brigade firefighters and 70 fire engines from across London fought the blaze. The tower burned for about 60 hours. As Jill watched the fire, she vowed to make sure we learn. To that end, in 2021, Jill published Catastrophe and Systemic Change, Learning from the Grenfell Tire, Tower, Fire and Other Disasters. Tonight, Jill joins us to discuss. Number one, how close are we to the next cat catastrophic event in construction? Number two, are we post Grenfell or pre the next Grenfell? Jill states, that the key to understanding and mitigating against catastrophic risk demands the ability to lead and navigate systemic complexity. Core to this value is, sorry, core to this, I do beg my pardon, is valuing equality of life and equality of voice. All lives matter and matter equally and all voices count. Those who power must ensure all voices are heard. As will be revealed, authenticity, compassion and courage are cornerstone values for Jill. After Jill's short and powerful presentation, we will hold an open Q&A and debate. Please use the chat facility on Teams. Many thanks in advance. London Constructing Excellence are actually delighted that we have been able to secure such a passionate and committed expert practitioner to present to us this evening about her journey to ensure we all learn from the Grenfell Tower disaster. So good people, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jill Koenig. Wonderful, thanks so much everybody. I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen for a second um, because I just wanna be with people. I'm actually also gonna ask a stupid thing that hopefully won't um, 
uh, make the system crash. But can people for a second turn your cameras on? Because otherwise I have this experience of speaking to little round boxes with initials in um, rather than human beings. And just for a second before I start, it would be wonderful if you're in a presentable state if you could just quickly turn your camera on so that I can see human beings um, and wave to you as we get into this conversation. Not many people are, oh, are you, it might be disabled. Paul, is it disabled that people share their cameras? So that might not be possible here. I'm asking people to do the impossible. That's very funny. Adrian, can you just enable cameras? Let's see if we can. <laughs> But enabled, mm -hmm. Adrian. You should be able to see me now. But is it enabled for other people to share? Oh, it's it's yeah, it's disabled for everybody else. And, and can you enable it for everybody else for a sec or not? Uh, I might not be able to disable it. All right, again. all right. I won't. I won't. I won't do it. So <laughs> I'm going to pretend that I can see everybody. Um, but I did want to see you because I struggle um, a lot in this virtual world with not really creating human connection. So my first request is that you imagine that I'm seeing a picture of you and I'm having this conversation with you personally, not with a little round blob with your initials in. So that is the first thing <laughs> that I would like to say. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to share my screen in fact i'm gonna um share my screen hold on one second and get into the conversation and i am going to start with a slido now most of you i assume no slido there's a link in the chat somewhere but you can also either go to slido.com and enter this code or what i find the easiest is use your phone and enter the qr code that I always used to call a QPR code for some reason. Um, you can enter the QR code. And the first thing I'd like you to enter is what three words describe how you felt when you first saw or heard of the Grenfell Tower fire. And if you enter one word at a time, because then it makes a good word cloud. So horror, shock, disbelief, sadness, scared, sick, embarrassed, distressed. And I think it's important for us to keep that present. I mean, it's shocking to me, but we're, you know, five months away from the five year anniversary. So if you allow yourself to, for a moment, just be present to that experience. And then I'm going to actually open another poll. We'll do all the polls now. How much do you think the construction industry's changed and learned since Greenfall? So in the last five years. I'll give it a couple of minutes so that people can respond. So slightly better, that's only nine responses, but slightly better. We're getting there. And I'm going to open another poll as well. You'll still be able to enter this, but I'll open another one. How satisfied you with are you with how your own organization um, or yourself, if you work for yourself, has changed since Grenfell.
And I'll just go back and forth so you can see the results. So slightly better. And neutral, some somewhat satisfied and some somewhat dissatisfied. And then I'm going to just again display the words we all felt when we saw the fire. And I would um, like to have that as the context for the conversation this evening. However uncomfortable that might make you feel, I think holding the what we thought might happen when we saw the fire and what has happened kind of front and center is really important. So I'm going to hopefully get through this fairly quickly um, and leave as much time as possible for questions, discussions, because that's my preference. But I, what I'm going to cover is some memories. Are we asking the right question? What I call the fish parable and particularly the role of dissonance. I know there's some people that have heard me speak before. I'm going to kind of go through quite quickly some of the stuff that I spoke about soon after the launch of the book and get into some new things that I think are important in terms of evolving the conversation. Um, so firstly, you know, as Alvin mentioned, I lived in Grenfell and I lived on the 21st floor. I loved it. Um, my husband and I were looking for somewhere to rent. We just moved back to London. We weren't ready to buy and found this apartment because we love this part of, um, of London and literally walked in. I'd never thought of living in a high rise building, but walked into the apartment and just went, where do we sign the lease? Um, and fell in love with high rise living. And in 2014, bought an apartment in Trelick Tower, which overlooks Grenfell. So at the time of before the fire, the, the, the picture on the bottom right is the picture that we had um, of Grenfell, which always reminded me of very good memories. And then as people have remembered yourselves so on the 14th of June, I, I couldn't sleep and I was next door and there was a whole host of noise and sirens and helicopters. But frankly, in London, that's not that unusual. So I don't really think anything apart from being annoyed. Uh, and then Jill, got, counter your slides. Oh, thanks for letting me know. I will try again. Uh, let me go off there. We're having a lot of slide sharing issues this evening. Can you see that now? Yes. Perfect. OK, so these are the pictures. I'll go back. These are the pictures of the apartment, just that people see that. And then um, I walked into my bedroom and th that that picture is one that I've chosen because the thing that sticks in my mind was the really heavy diagonal flame, the bright diagonal flame is is what I remember of that night. But I also um, had other memories because professionally I work in high hazard industries and I've done a lot of work in Aberdeen and oil and gas and spent a lot of time with people that were impacted by Piper Alpha that it was an event that really changed people's life. If you if you spend time in Aberdeen and oil and gas, you can't get away from that experience. So I had that picture in my mind at the same time, not knowing how many similarities there would be. Because for those of you that don't know Piper Alpha, um, they did a refurbishment which made it more dangerous. And people, the people that survived were people that jumped into the sea. So they defied policy. The policy was never jump into the sea. It will lead to it will lead to certain death. Um, but the only people that survived were those people that violated that policy and jumped into the sea. So there's always for me been this very personal and then deeply professional interest in um, rental. But if I look back to the last five years, I never would have imagined how hard it would be. Um, so there's not a day that I don't think about it and the revelations from the inquiry. So don't worry if I cry, it's normal. I like a blow to the stomach. So it's not like it's done and you get over it. You just hear 
somebody else didn't do their job, somebody else didn't do their job, somebody else didn't do their job. And then the lack that combined with the lack of change is just like a punch in the teeth. So I really have learned to live in this very strange dual world um, where there's all the lack of change in my pain and my anger um, and then committing to making a difference. And that's me. I don't know. Or I have some sense because I, I know them, but I can't imagine what it's like for the bereaved and survivors to every day um, have to hear about somebody else failing them in a way that that led to their loved ones being lost. So it it is hard. Um, and then I'm just going to do this as a reminder or for people that don't know, you know, in terms of the multiple failures. So I'm very much an advocate of Grenfell was not just the cladding. You know, the windows were changed. Um, there was no cavity barriers around the windows. The architectural crown, which was purely aesthetic, um, caused the building to get engulfed because it enabled the horizontal flow of flames um, and then there were massive internal control failures that made both rescue and escape very difficult and I think people will know the details of that but I'm not going to go into it so we have this situation where a small kitchen fire Elvin I think you're not on mute if you could mute so a very small kitchen fire spreads within 15 minutes up 19 floors by 114, compartmentation is broken even before the firefighters um, put flame to the fire. And then the stay put strategy, which the whole firefighting approach relied on, didn't work. And stay put became untenable at 114 at the point that compartmentation was broken, but it was only reversed at 247. And all of us, I think, probably know those. Um, figures and then the devastating results 297 people in the tower 78 under the age of 18 and 227 escaped 72 people died 25 men 29 women 18 children median age of 40 the oldest victim was 84 and the youngest victim after Logan Isaac was six months um, the picture at the bottom is uh, my former neighbor so that's Marcio Gomez who and Andrea, who um, lost Logan Isaac, who was still born at seven months. Um, I always say this is if people haven't, I would highly recommend. So Marcia was on the phone with the fire service at the moment that the flames entered his flat. So there's a really extraordinary, it's awful. I, I was at the inquiry the day he gave the testimony, but um, it, it, he, there's this extraordinary capturing of his escape with his wife, his two children, a neighbour and her child down the stairs. Um, and I think everybody that works in construction should listen to that in terms of really understanding the human cost of our failures when we don't get it right. Um, and what I thought would happen was a unified cross-party response. Survivors and bereaved would be taken care of, buildings would be made safe, and there'd be bold leadership from government and industry. But that's not really what happened. So we found out, um, do you know, about failures in the response. I'm very, very um, def um, defensive of the firefighters on the ground. I don't blame them or think it's their fault at all. They were, but they were massive failures in the fire service. Um, if, for example, stay put an article of faith and then in the, the way that the fire survivor guidance calls and advice were given. Um, and then obviously there's, and again, many will know this, multiple failures to learn. Um, it, you know, the, the Lacknell House is the big one, but then there's also Garner Corked um, from 1999. That's evidence from the London Fire Brigade in a, a Commons Committee um, investigation into that death. And then we all, that's um, Catherine, I can't remember her name, Hinkman, I think from Lacknell. And one of the findings from Lacknell was that in fire survival guidance calls, you shouldn't give people false hope that the fire service would actually get to them because you didn't know. And that was not heeded in Grenfell. Um, in terms of that's one of the failures. There were also other recommendations in terms of um, external spread of fire, but that's one that people I think sometimes don't know about. And also there was the, the picture on the bottom there is a 
tall buildings, facade fire presentation by the London Fire Brigade. So they did know of the dangers. So the failures to learn and then what we hear in the inquiry is what I call back passing and questionable con um, competence. So, you know, bad value engineering um, saves 300k k on, on cladding and ends with 72 people dying. And then I think it's the, the great corporate scandal around the manufacturers knowing of the fire risks and the gaming of testing systems and product classifications. And it's very difficult for me to find anybody um, in the inquiry who actually did their job, which is frightening. I, I knew it would be bad because I study major accidents, so I'd anticipated that there would be multiple failings, but I never could have imagined it would be as bad as it is. And then one that's partic of particular passion to me is the failure to listen to residents' voices. Um, this is a quote from a blog by Eddie Defan and Francis O'Connor. I think it was about six months before the fire. Francis O'Connor actually died um, last year. So, you know, this was just one of a number of examples of residents' voices being silenced, being called aggressive or et cetera, rebels, et cetera. And then we've got the building safety crisis. So this is not a matter of Grenfell being an isolated building. We know that there's decades of poor practice that's led to a massive building safety crisis. And the near misses continue. You know, and we saw, and again, this is not a um, national issue. I think it's international. I'm sure people would have seen the Bronx fire. So there's been Philadelphia and Bronx fires in the States in the last couple of weeks. I'm not going to read through these quotes, but if you just look, this is um, from Hackett from the interim report, the final report, and then the um, ISSG um, progress reports, the last one being from January this year. So if we look at progress and change, just take a moment and have a look at those. And then we are now entering um, the domain of government getting involved. So th there have been a number of House of Commons reports, but this was one from 2020. And then Michael go, was it last week? I can't, I forget time, but. So we're now in the, in the territory and, and who knows where it will lead of the government. But, but when you look at it, um, We, if we go right back to 1994, and these are, this is not an area of expertise for me, it's something I'm increasingly interested in, but many of you on the call will know much more about the Latham Report and the Egan Report than I do. But when you look at them, are the issues really that different from the ones we're facing with now? So when we look at the failure to change, is it a failure to change post Grenfell, or is it a failure to change? like a systemic failure to change in the built environment. So my question is, are we asking the right question? And the question I would be looking at is, why does it make sense that the construction industry does not change and not post rainfall, but just does not change? In my book, I, I distinguish between these two things, piecemeal versus systemic change. And I wonder if there's a very much a focus on piecemeal change and a failure to try and understand why there's no systemic change. Why are we not shifting the conditions holding the status quo in place? So we might fix fire doors, but we're not fixing the um, race to the bottom culture, the lack of leadership, the lack of willingness to do the right thing. And my big bug bugbear, we're not fixing procurement, which as long as I've worked in the industry, everybody said to me needs fixing, but we don't fix it. So what is this about? Um, and just as an explanation, I'd like to talk about what I call the fish parable. So there's two fish um, swimming along and the one fish says to the other, how's the water? And the response is, what's water? So I think one of the things that we need to do when we're exploring systemic issues is begin to make the water visible. And what I wish I could see much more in the built environment and construction industry is serious conversations that make the water visible that are really inward, um, actually inward looking to the degree of, well, why aren't we changing? What are the conditions holding our failure to change in place? 
Um, and again, in the book, which I, I'm not going to go into in much detail, is what I offer is this model for systemic change. So a way of looking and exploring issues where you can look at more the more obvious things. So foundational structural stru structural elements and then behavioral elements. So regulations, guidance, governance, accountabilities, and then how the regulator operates, scrutiny, scrutiny mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we operate a lot on that level. But are we really exploring how interactions between stakeholders contributes to catastrophic events? Are we looking at reg regulatory capture, the revolving door between business and industry? the funding of government, government by, um, you know, building people that are involved in construction or development, the issues with speaking truth to power. Do we look at contextual elements? So do we explore the culture where there's issues of trust, not trust, what our biases are, what our unquestioned assumptions and beliefs are? You know, do we look at the myths that we hold? Do we look at the conditions holding things in place? And do we really consider, well, how would we make meaningful change in construction? Because I don't think what we're doing, well, it's not just me. Many people think what we're not doing, what we're currently doing is leading to the type of change that's needed. So I'm going to end with a couple of thoughts on, on culture and dissonance. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's from the International Atomic Energy Agency, and I will read it out. The biggest danger in trying to understand culture is to oversimplify it in our minds. It's tempting to say that culture is just the way we are doing things around here or our basic values or our rituals and so on. These are all manifestations of the culture, but none is the culture at the level that culture matters. A better way to think about culture is to realize that it exists at several levels and that we must endeavor to understand the different levels, but especially the deeper levels. And again, in my book, I propose this model for, for looking at um, exploring context or systemically. Um, and above the waterline, we have kind of our espoused intent in our formal systems. And a lot of the work that I see coming out of constructions is, is on the domain of charters and ways of measurement and all of these systems, but I see very little um, conversation, open conversation happening around the informal systems, around the sense making and the stories and the narratives that we create and fundamentally what's the embodied intent. And these are much more difficult and um, require a huge amount of psychological safety to explore in a meaningful way. But if we don't do that, I don't think there will be meaningful change. Um, and I want to talk about particularly the role of dissonance, because I think we shy away from dissonance. We want things, especially in England, to be all nice and polite and neat. But actually, dissonance is our access to change. So where our, we should stop focusing just on what we espouse on all these formal systems. And I see there's another organization saying something great. And we should start exploring where there's dissonance between what we're saying and what's actually happening and create openings and opportunities and conversations where we can really get into understanding what are the systemic issues that are inhibiting or stopping change. So you can't have culture, meaningful cultural change in the way that Judith Hackett is calling for without disrupting the status quo. Something massive has to change power needs to get rebalanced. Um, and the nature of disruption, I think, is often misunderstood. So I often talk about what I call the disruptive nature of kindness, simply having a conversation where we can be open and honest about areas of dissonance is a disruptive act. It doesn't have to be an aggressive, difficult thing, but we do need disruption and we need disruptors. And the voices we don't want to hear are often our biggest access to disruption. And one of the things that worries me a lot about construction and, and the response from the built environment is the amount of voices that are excluded or not welcomed into conversations. Mm -hmm. So we must begin to expose the, narr the narratives that we use to silence others and how that maintains the status quo. So to close with, I'd, I would leave you with four questions, is why does it make sense that the construction industry fails to change? And again, just to reiterate, I don't believe that's a function of just post rainfall change. Are you exploring areas of dissonance? Are you questioning the narratives we use to silence? 
and who's not included in the conversations for change would be four questions that I would think would be useful for the industry to inquire into. Um, and I'm going to stop there for people that don't know. The book is Catastrophe and Systemic Change. And there's also a six episode podcast series that brings in other expert guests to more dive into some of the topics. And you can follow me um, on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. I'm quite active there. And I am going to stop sharing and finish and hopefully get into some interesting conversations. Right. So, Jill, can you hear me OK? I can, yes. Excellent. Thank you so very, very much for that, Jill. Um, what we'd like to do now, everybody, is to uh, have a debate, really, and, and ask questions and uh, and also uh, thoughts, feelings, observations, I think, Jill. Is that OK if people send in their thoughts, feelings, observations on what you've said? Um, because it is, it is deeply personal. Um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, that the the term disruptor and disruption uh and i think you've alluded to it. it's not very english is it no, not no. Very, it's not very english thing <laughs> well to do. human beings don't like disruption though but you know we like we like comfort so just we don't like change human beings are not we're not designed to change we're designed to be comfortable so i think you know i think you have to understand if you're going to change that will be disruptive and you need to be willing to dive into that i just want to check um is it at all possible to unmute people adrian now because it's fine if they stay unmuted because if people have questions and don't want to we've got some questions chat, actually yeah first yeah. and foremost i've got some questions here for you first yeah. i will say thank you so much to adrian adrian wilkins who says uh thank you jill thank you so powerful and thought-provoking stay strong which is a uh, a lovely thought and sentiment. Thank you, Adrian. Sue, Sue Butcher has said, how do you think that people in construction can start um, listening to uh, the disruption? How can they Disruptive start voices, to listen? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? So, um, so firstly, hi, Sue. Um, I was talking about you earlier today. So anyway, hi. Um, I, I think probably you have to first, there's probably a pre-step to it, is you have to understand why you're silencing voices and explore who is being silenced. So, um, I, I mean, it's, far, it's four and a half years after Grenfell. This is probably the second event that I'm doing in construction. Um, and I've start, I've, I've recently started to share this. And I'm not saying that as a, oh, you should listen to me. I'm some guru. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But because I'm not an an insider, I don't I don't really know if that's the right term. Because before Grenfell, I wasn't an insider. Um, my voice certainly wasn't welcomed. It, it is a little bit more now, but that's because I've got credibility in a book, and you know, a lot of other people listen to me. So people probably think they should listen to me. And I know I'm not the only person that's experienced that. So there's a lot of people that want to make a difference that are not necessarily from the inside or um, from traditional um, places that you'd listen to. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's like there's all this stuff going on that you just get a shut door to. So I think, so. I think the first thing is, is, is really looking at, well, who, who do you not listen to and why? Um, and I think you could do that on an individual level, but I think you could probably also do that on a stakeholder level. So whose whose views do we value? Whose views do we not value? And there'll be a lot of bias in those. I, hey, I mean, you, you yeah, you could just create. I mean, there's a lot of conversations you could create that would explore that quite systematically and reveal reveal things. Because actually, just moving on, because Sandy, thank mm -hmm. you, Sandy Mackay, uh, for disruption to happen. The disruptor has to have uh, a voice, uh, and I should say, have the power to make changes. For disruption to, ha to, to happen, the disruptor has to have the power to make change. What's your thoughts on that one, uh, Jill? Well, uh, um, for change to happen, somebody in power needs to make different decisions. So there is an absolutely a relationship, a power dynamic in systemic change. 
but I'm not sure that for disruption to happen, the disruptors have to have the power. And I think a really good example of this is the campaigning by those caught up in the cladding scandal. So um, they don't have power. So they've put their lives on hold. And I know because I do some campaigning and I do some campaigning locally, you literally put your life on hold and you have to campaign government to change. Now, right now, I have my cynical thoughts about why that is. That's being really effective with Gove. Um, so I, I, I think there's a power element, but I think anybody can be a disruptor. I'm a disruptor. I don't have any power. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to pick up. Claire, Claire Armstrong. Thank you, Claire. A question is: With Grenfell aside from residents, who else was silenced when they should have had a voice? Which is going to go in the same lines of what you've been talking about, there, Jill. So, who was silenced when they should have had a voice outside of the residents? Well, even if you if you look at Sue's put something in there about the the testimony of the manufacturers, so. I, they, they'll and actually I did I didn't read that um, evidence in as much detail as others. But even if you go right back to the construction site, there were some statements by and I, I think it's Simon Lawrence who was the manager of the site that he'd written emails that um, the project was really bad. Now we all know if there's a bad project, there's going to be safety issues. So I th I think all the way along. Um, voices have been silenced. And I think we're only going to hear more and more around who wasn't listened to. So you can go back to Lacanel, so Francis Kirkham, who was the um, uh, the inquest QC, I forget, I think there's coroner, the coroner for the Lacanel inquests, her recommendations weren't listened, weren't, weren't implemented. If you look at um, the um, I'm, I'm going to get all the names wrong. The FSS, Egypt, if the fire, the, the whatever committee, FSSG, I think it's called, um, they raised numerous letters uh, asking for change post Lacknell that were ignored. That'll come out in module six. We'll see a lot of that. So letters to Gavin Barwell, um, Eric Pickles, letter after letter that was ignored both by senior civil servants and by government ministers calling for change. So I think there's a lot of voices that were silenced throughout the system and still are, frankly. I mean, there's a lot. I, yeah. I was at an event, a couple of events last year where th there's two things that I've heard is hospitals are the next major accident waiting to happen in terms of cladding. And modern methods of constructions are not resilient, and it's going to be the next made that the next building safety crisis will be through MMC. So I'm not an expert in either of those things, but there's enough people in industry yeah. that know where the next issues are, but we're not dealing with them. We're just going ahead with it. So right now, voices are being silenced as well. Just a very, very, very quick question, so, uh, Piper Alpha. Mm -hmm. In your with your okay, your your recollection and how you deem it, has that industry, oil and gas, made significant changes and could and could uh, uh, another Alpha Piper happen again? Well, Piper Alphas could always happen again. Another Grainfall could happen again. So there's two things I'd say: major accidents can always happen. So low probability, high consequence events can always happen. And I think part of the um, the, the point that I try that I have tried to make since Greenfall is that you have to look at low probability, high consequence risk differently, and you can't assess how well you're doing against normal metrics. So the the, the fact that um, the number of fires in buildings might be declining doesn't mean you're not at risk of a catastrophic event because it's a different type of event. So the, the, the oil industry really understands that a Piper Alpha could happen tomorrow. So it practices what I call chronic unease. Um, yes, I, tell I chronic that's, yes, yes. I think do, that's do, very, very quickly, things. tell people about chronic unease. Well done. Please do just uh, unpack chronic unease because it is well, extraordinarily important in safety. 
yeah. Chronic unease is is um is imagining and then mitigating against the worst thing that could go wrong. So again, you you need to think of risk differently. It's not um slips, trips and falls or or the kind of um personal safety domain, all mental health domain. So it's 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 not on that personal safety, health and well being domain. It's what what's a a, a, an event that could happen that would kill multiple people or lead to major damage to property. And if you practice chronic unease, you're actively looking for what's the worst thing that can, can go wrong. And also then actively looking at, well, how can we prevent that? So, how, you know, what, what do we need to do to prevent that from happening? And if it did happen, how would we respond? So you're preparing yes, but- yourself in a particular way. And it's a mindset, I would, I would say. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Jill. Because a lot of people think chronic unease is like a, a babbling fool, but it's not. It is a state of mind. It's actually, mm-hmm. it's a state of readiness, isn't it? Yeah. In, well, and it's anticipating what could go wrong. Yes. It's it's, it's anticipating. Okay, what could go wrong? Yeah. Which I, I didn't actually mention specifically. What you were talking about is, are we related? As if we're post grenfell or pre the next grenfell. If yeah. you were practicing chronic unease, you would have the mindset of we're pre the next grenfell. So when's the yes. next grenfell going to happen? And also, not just that it's going to happen from fire. So could it happen from building collapse or what other catastrophic yeah. failure yeah. could happen? I mean, in last week. I don't know, many people here would have seen it, but um, finally plans were withdrawn for a 51-storey building with one um, staircase, Yeah, which still boggles my mind. And then the answer is, well, it had lifts. Well, what happens yeah. if the lifts fail? So that's an, that, that designer or architect is certainly not practicing chronic unease. Yeah, no, no, well played, well played. Can I just bring something to, uh, uh, to our attention here from Sue, Sue Butcher? She says, so many people I work with um, who work for big companies cannot say anything in public and don't think they can say things in the private space either. They avoid it because of fear of what would it do for their careers. Um, I think we have to go get over that. What's your thoughts on that one, Jim? Well, so I completely agree. Um, I think... I I get that a lot is people telling me things in private that they're afraid about raising, and I do think, again, you know, the things found truly shocking um, is that seventy two deaths did not lead to um, leadership from the most senior people in industry. And if some of you are on the call, um, I, I don't apologise for calling that because. If you want to create a psychologically safe space, people within industry and very senior positions would be saying things that everybody else is thinking and they're not. So, you know, I really, I really, really did think that a catastrophe like that in London five years ago would lead to, I imagine, that you get government and the most senior leaders in construction and banking and insurance together in a room figuring out how to fix it. I really, I mean, I now know that I was naive, but I really did think that would happen. I, I want to, Elvin, go back to a point that you said in terms of Piper Alpha and the change in the oil and gas yes. industry. So oil and gas has changed. I'm not saying it's perfect, but Piper Alpha and particularly actually Macondo so the big, um, the big um, Gulf of Mexico disaster really changed the industry. But again, this is probably not going to be too popular in this audience. I think a large part of that was commercial. So one of my bugbears is there. Ha- if if you're serious about change, there should be financial consequences. Fin- financial yeah. consequences drive change, and right now consequences are borne by taxpayers or by leaseholders. And I understand that um, it, it's difficult and it's tricky and it's how are we going to do this? Um, and it'll be interesting to see what comes out of Gove's comments last week. But when the people that um, are guilty of bad practice don't pay for that, and in many cases are actually being paid to remediate it, so they're profiting from it. Yes. 
Uh, it, of course, you're not going to change because it's no consequence. You know, so yeah. I watch the share price of a lot of a lot of the product manufacturers yeah. and the major developers, and I'm like, well, if you if you look, BP's share price has never recovered since Macondo. Really? But it seems to, no. It seems to be that um, the impact, the financial impact, and and part of that is because of the complexity and its local yeah. authority and all of that, but there hasn't been financial consequences. So there's not an imperative to change in the same yeah. way that there was with oil and gas. Good stuff. Okay. Can I very quickly just clear up something for Paul, Paul Busey? Uh, we do apologize, Paul, and it has been picked up by Tony Putzman. Uh, what myself and Jill were talking about was chronic unease. I do apologize if uh, my excitement- What did you say? It, 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 yeah, it wasn't it was a one word, it is a chronic, and then the second word is unease. So unease, apologies for that. Exactly. Uh, very quickly here from Claire, Claire Armstrong. Do you think that part of the cultural issue, the cultural issue is of people sending an email or similar and therefore thinking they have done their bit to flag an issue and, uh, and therefore wash their hands of it? What do you think? Uh, well, I, I have a hate of emails. So, um, I, a lot in oil and gas, what happens is people email a new policy and then call that implementation. So we've implemented a new policy when what they've done is emailed it to people. So I think email, um, so so I think email is a form of communication and particularly a form of change. It's just like forget about it. It doesn't do anything apart from, as you say, Claire, make the, the sender maybe feel a little bit happier or cover their ass in some way because they've sent the email. <laughs> So yes, I mean, email didn't, an email never changed anything. Very good. No, conversations, and I would go back to conversations too, and particularly difficult conversations and conversations around dissonance and conversations that are open and honest and psychologically safe. Yeah. And I don't think we have the space for those right now. Very, just want a quick, uh, 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 thank you, Sad. It's one um, of his thoughts here, uh, Jill. I agree on lack of leadership. After Ronan Point, which of course is a, a, was a collapse of in East London, uh, many actions were taken quickly. But since then, the industry has fragmented. So ownership of the problem by one company no longer happens. In 1968, there were a few huge constru construction companies who knew they had to act. Do you think that has uh, any um, uh, major impact on what you're trying to achieve now, do you think, Jill? So, I, I, so firstly, in terms of Ronan Point, if I'm correct, I, I, I think I'm correct on this. Well, post Grenfell, there was more scrutiny around um, the corrective actions post Ronan Point, and they actually found that a lot of local authorities had failed to keep records. So, which I think is very relevant um, in the the current conversations post Grenfell. So, they'd failed to keep records of change and what they'd done to correct any um, issues post Ronan Point. And actually there were still uh, hundreds, if I remember correctly, of buildings that hadn't been mitigated post Ronan Point. So maybe there was some immediate action, but I think if you look back on that, there were, um, I, th I think I put it in my book, but certainly at some points I've researched um, that actually not everything was changed or corrected. But I do think that um, complex supply chains is a major issue. Yeah. And um, one of my points is always you can't, you can't defer risk down a supply chain. So you can't go, OK, well, you might go, you're accountable for doing this part of the work, but the risk exists collectively. Um, and, and I struggle with I was at a, speaking at a conference last year and I said to people, how many of you are meeting collectively with everybody in your supply chain to understand risk? So you, there's exercises that you could do like bow tie exercises. There's simple things yeah. you can do to collectively understand risk. Three people out of 300 put their hands up. And I think that's yeah. probably um, the same across industry. So you, you have to collectively own risk because the nature of catastrophic events is such that it could have, you know, the holes and the barriers or whatever model you want to use could exist anywhere. So you can't go, OK, well, we are safe and it's not safe anywhere else. You have to speak to each other to understand the risks. Just for, just and that's difficult. Wrap, in a 
got sorry, yeah. Uh, 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 Kenny, Kenny McPhail um, has said here, general comment across the industry. There are still managers and executives that may prefer not to hear about organizational risks that may have been overlooked. So these are ignored, unfortunately. If these are exposed, the messenger is shot. Now, is this the real problem do you, do you think we're getting to uh, here, um, Jill, is that there is uh, an unease about raising this. Is, is, is that what we've come to? There, there's a malaise of, I'm not going to say anything, I don't want to be shot. Do you, you know, very well, there's quickly. Something, so firstly, I wouldn't say that there's ever one thing, but there's something called the watermelon effect, which I think a lot of executives suffer from. So they look for the green and the good news, and they don't look for what's inside the watermelon, which is all the bad news. So I always say executives' jobs is to welcome bad news. That's their most important job. And I'll end there. So that is superb. Jill, we're so, so grateful uh, for your time and your energy uh, this evening uh, and your willingness to talk openly about something that is, you know, without a doubt, it's so personal to you, so, so, so personal. Um, deeply grateful to you, Jill, deeply. Um, so uh, just want to let everybody know uh, before we wrap, uh, just, and if you could just hold there for a moment, Jill, just a few particularly important notices before we close. Our next event um, is actually uh, virtual again, Tuesday, the 8th of February. And uh, it is an evening, we'll start uh, at six, conclude at seven, Matthew Wells, director of Teneca Limited. Uh, clue is in the title for his um, event. Uh, that is, cross-laminated timber is not the new concrete. So we look forward to that. Please do respond to me. Please respond to the feedback email. Uh, should you receive, uh, you should receive, sorry, the next 24 hours, uh, we do everything we can to use your comments to continue to improve our product and services to meet your needs. Many thanks in advance. Now, so to round up good people, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, extremely grateful to you all. Uh, please, big grateful thanks to the hardworking uh, London Constructing Excellence Management team. Good on you, chaps. Uh, the typical wizardry of Said, who co-produced this evening's event, plus your very good selves for participating this evening. Thank you so much. And many, many thanks once again to the quite brilliant speaker, Jill, Jill Koenig. Jill, thank you so much for being here. We're very, very grateful. Did you enjoy yourself, Jill? Yes, I did, actually. It was my first talk this year, so thanks very much. I wish I'd seen people, but it was great. <laughs> uh, very, very good. Uh, uh, deeply appreciated. Jill, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Good night to you all, and we look forward to interacting with you once again in four weeks' time. Good night.